Welcome to More Christ. Today I'm joined by Dr. Spencer Clavin. Spencer has a PhD in classics and is the assistant editor of the Claremont Review of Books on the American Mind of the Claremont Institute. His literary expertise is aided by his knowledge of many languages, including ancient Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. As a scholar who enjoys exploring how great works of literature provide valuable insights into today's world, Spencer hosts the wonderful Young Heretics every Tuesday. First, then, um, I just wanted to ask you about my fellow Irishman, C.S. Lewis, as oh, yeah. video, and Lewis is the first I actually watched uh, of Young Heart Spencer. So um, I wonder why, first of all, does he speak to you so much as you even described him as the greatest intellectual of the 20th century? And then as a second part of that question, if I may, what is then a Christian intellectual, I suppose, properly understood versus, say, modern intellectuals as decried by people like Thomas Sowell then? Mm. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And the phrase that I always use or the word that keeps coming up when I try to explain why Lewis has touched me so much is just companionship. Um, it's a concept that doesn't get wielded enough in literary circles, I think. You know, the, I, the notion of companionship between the reader and the author which in some ways is kind of a, it's just that ineffable moment that you open a book and you feel suddenly as if you're not quite uh, so alone. I mean, Lewis actually describes this aspect of, of friendship in The Four Loves when he talks about the, that feeling of, you know, oh, you too, I thought I was the only one, right? Mm -hmm. That's the uh, thought that I just kept having as I would walk uh, by the river actually in in oxford in grad school and maybe it had something to do with being far from home and needing a you know a friendly voice um but also just uncovering such lucid uh expression for things that had been kind of floating mistily around in my mind you know i'm reading uh rereading the brothers karamazov at the moment uh because i'm doing some work on it and there's a section in which Alyosha, the kind of chief brother, the youngest brother, who's also this sort of holy, uh, you know, almost saintly figure, although part of his quest is to go out into the world and make contact with the world and, and indeed in some ways be, be besmirched by it or get, get, his, get its dirt on his hands. Um, he says at one point, I think, you know, I feel foolish making this sort of argument, or I feel foolish saying, you know, what's on my heart at this moment. And I think that um, that's, there's, there's always a certain reticence or shyness when you really touch upon a matter of great sincerity. I think that's just a natural human reaction, but especially matters of faith, which are so tender and so close to the heart um, that and which are so maligned, as you, I'm sure, well know and have encountered, you know, the, the hostility to faith as an intellectual enterprise is so great uh, in sort of just the atmosphere of our day um, that to find somebody who was not afraid to speak simply and clearly and yet at a very high intellectual level uh, about the faith as if it were a defensible philosophical outlook. Of course, that's not the only thing that Lewis thinks Christianity is, but um, he certainly does think it is that and had to fight his way to it in those terms as, as somebody of great intelligence, you know. And so, I, you know, I'm thinking about the in, in Brothers K, the, the fight between Ivan and Alyosha, it's not even a fight, just the tension between these two brothers, one of whom is, you know, saintly and the other of whom is the great intellect. You know, Ivan is, is too intelligent for his own good, as many characters in Dostoevsky are. Um, and in some ways, both of those brothers are, were in Lewis. You know, he, he had that incredibly sharp, piercing philologist's intellect. Um, and he was a, a master logician um, taught in, in many ways, I think, by Aristotle. Uh, and yet he was also the holy fool i mean he was capable of of you know unleashing these vast wellsprings of uh you wouldn't want to call it sentimentalism but certainly sentiment um and 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 expressing grief and touching upon at one point in, in the weight of glory which is a very beautiful lecture sermon he gave he talks about ripping open some childhood wound and speaking into it um, and he was capable of that as well and i just found that uh, electrifying and i still do i think that's to me that's what makes him the greatest intellectual it's not that there aren't other people with great insight and and uh you know important things to contribute to the to 20th century discourse it's that lewis was unashamed uh to bring his erudition to bear on those really tender parts of our uh of, of our of our life
Mm, wonderful. Thanks, Spencer. And I would commend anybody to actually watch your episode on Lewis, of course. And uh, you also discuss in a number of episodes his friend, uh, Barfield, and focusing on things like saving the appearances. That kind of just sprung uh, some questions in my mind, if this is hopefully clear enough for you. Mm. So in part listening to your series and in part based on a recent conversation I had with Jonathan Pajot and Bernardo Castro, where Bernardo constantly referred to the nominal and the role of um, the nominal and our understanding of reality at these different levels. I want to ask you, that, um, kind of in line with that book and your work more broadly, how might we come to understand the kind of incarnate nature of language, if we might call it that, and how a God reveals himself as the word versus what seems to be a dominant nominalism that's developed in the West? And maybe from a Christian perspective, what are some of the main problems with nominalism? Does that make mm -hmm. sense? It certainly does, yes, and I'm I'm glad you're talking to Jonathan about this because to me, to, to my mind, there's no better interlocutor on the, on this subject. I mean, we've only had the opportunity to sort of hang out once, but this was really what we talked about, and Barfield was the guy that we kept coming back to among the Inklings, but also just more generally, um, because he wasn't the writer that Lewis was, as I think I said in that series, um, and that's uh, as a result, his reputation has suffered, or his you know sort of fame, his, his fame has suffered. Fewer people have read him. Um, and yet he has this crucial contribution to make, um, which I think can be traced back, you know, through the romantic poets and even before them uh, to this fellow Thomas Traherne, who's going to be the subject of the episodes that have just started releasing. So there's another series coming up on, on Traherne. Um, in which I sort of used Traherne to read Matthew 6 and that whole series of sayings about do not your righteousness to be seen before men. So seeing and speaking, right, are kind of the two issues that you raise when you talk about nominalism or, uh, you know, the word, the word made flesh. And there's a wonderful passage in Saving the Appearances uh, in which Barfield cites Aquinas for the concept, um, you know, not just of the the verbal word, which as I, as I understand nominalism, this sort of real focus on language as uh, the actual utterance that we produce, you know, the, the way that we apply sounds or arbitrarily assign sounds to, you know, thoughts and, and experiences. Um, but for Barfield, and he's really following Aquinas here, that utterance, the thing that I say with my lips or scratch into the ground or whatever kind of token I give you, material token I give you of language, um, is in some sense the tip of this vast iceberg. Um, and I'm uh, hopefully representing this right because I'm now inventing a, a, an image for it that is not in Aquinas. But as I think of it, right, your spoken word, your written word, um, is, in, is the final visible tip of an enormous process that goes right down to the bedrock of reality and the verbum intellectus, the, the intellect word or the mind word, um, it really refers to the thing about our cognitive experience, the thing about our mental experience of the world um, that is represented or tokenized by that final act of language. And so what a, what a Barfieldian I think would wanna say is, you know, Take, for instance, the fights we're having in the political sphere about man and woman, right, as as categories. Do these categories obtain? Do they describe real, you know, realities? And there's a very strong kind of push, as you know, to say, no, actually, this these are kind of conventional assignments that we make, that we impose upon the world. Um, but Barfield and Aquinas would say, uh, quite to the contrary, our experience is... In, inherently threaded through with these categories, with these kind of, uh, with order and meaning. Um, and that we don't just have kind of brute sensory experiences with no governing principle. And we, you know, we then kind of apply or impose these templates of, of, of order and logic, um, shapes and, and, you know, the kind of concepts that we build up from there, but rather inextricable in our experience are these more abstract concepts. And those are what you might call the, the intellect word, the, the sort of inner word. Um, and so it's only when we, you know, 
when we say language, the only thing we're doing is we're we're basically giving a uh, visible form to what's going on internally so that you can then receive it and we can share it together and kind of bandy it about. Um, and and so what that would suggest is that even further down, you know, in that iceberg beyond our own sort of perceptive faculties and how they work, um, there's something about the world that is most really expressed or described as having that order in it. It's not just a bunch of sort of interchangeable blocks or atoms or pieces that you're rearranging at will. Um, those blocks actually already come freighted with a certain degree of, of order. And the only way for that to be true is if our consciousness is reflective of some creative consciousness, right? So this is why, you know, the, it's an inherently theist argument to be making in, in some ways. Um, but this idea, you know, Aquinas makes this wonderful comparison. He says, when, when we speak, um, we are able to both communicate and to have an effect on one another, right? Um, and, and these are kind of two different ways that our, our verbal language works. Um, and he says, and this is in some sense true of the second person as the word as well, because, you know, when John says, without him, not one thing was made that was made, then we're talking about God's word as totally effective. That is, you know, it's the, it's the sort of ultimate thing of which our effective speech is only a uh, pale emanation. So if I say to you, you know, would you, you know, hand me that mug, right? I'm, I'm doing something to you, I'm causing you to do something, but there's all sorts of, you know, interference in between us. I, I can't just make you do it by saying it. Uh, but I'm kind of reflecting there as the image of God, right? As we all are, I'm kind of reflecting the way that God's language works entirely. Um, that that order making part of language is kind of who he is always and certainly throughout all creation. Um, and then in Christ, right, in the incarnation, we have kind of the expressive function of language, that this is where language kind of gets across certain ideas that are, if you will, in God's head, right? Um, but this is, all of this is, to me, crucially important as an antidote to what I call scientism, right? Not physical science, which I'm perfectly happy with, um, but this notion um, which is, was expressed, I think, most of all by Pierre Simon Laplace, this, who had this vision of, you know, what if God's mind could see all the different parts moving around? Well, it would be able to predict the deterministic laws that would cause each, you know, next thing to happen, and all moments would sort of be as one for him. Um, to me, what's so lost from that, and what's lost from all of our kind of materialism and our reduction of the world to billiard balls bouncing off each other, um, is the fact that in order to even make claims like that, you're operating, perhaps invisibly, with a mind that knows how to talk about things like motion, right, and billiard balls, and, and those sorts of things are actually not present anywhere in the brute matter, what the Greeks would have called the hule or the stuff. Um, they're actually themselves immaterial concepts, and so we find ultimately we can't fight our way out of this deeper sense of language making not we can we can fight our way out of you know using english or writing things but we can't fight our way out of the uh order that is inherent in things um without which we can't even see meaningfully or talk to one another or or do anything uh other than you know sort of wave our our hands about uh in in increasingly nonsensical ways mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks, Spencer. And um, one thing that sort of sprung to my mind there as you were speaking, when you just described that kind of crude notion of God seeing the whole picture um, as one in time, I suppose, in the same way that we would do. Um, that, sort, that sort of notion came up, actually, in my conversation with Jonathan and Bernardo Castro. And it seems that's one of the, that's one of the big stumbling blocks for someone like Bernardo Castro, a, he seems to have this conception of the kind of Christian God as metacognitive, a, perceiving reality uh, in the same sort of way that we do, and resorts, I think, to uh, kind of an in intuition or instinct from below, as it were, and he's very influenced by figures like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, just, I know you're, you're just going off a very cursory description that I'm giving you and I don't want to do injustice to him but have you come across this idea that people sort of retreat to that so one of the things he referenced was how chess players would look at a, whenever they were playing chess they wouldn't even look at the board they'd go off instinct and see a number of um, players ahead whereas it seems to me from the Christian perspective and 
kind of implicitly in what I discern in your your um series of episodes of, on different figures is that there's this higher intuition that's sort of breaking through and again God's kind of transcending time and it speaks to that limit that limit of our language again even transcendence sort of suggests a spatial element or does that make sense and I wonder what you mm-hmm. think about that certainly yeah and I think we can acknowledge at the outset right that all of our language this is something lewis is wonderful at expressing and and barfield's book poetic diction is really about this um that all of our language has kind of dead spatial metaphors calcified in it and there's therefore never going to be because how could it not right since we are i mean if we are the kind of like russian doll nested egg within god's material universe I mean, if we are his image you know in that context we're always going to be bound by the limits of our material being, you know, and so we're always going to be using these sort of um, even the word abstract, this wonderful point that Barfield makes, right? You're, you're actually what you're really doing is you're deploying the Latin word trajo, which is to drag and ab, which is away from. And you're just talking about drawing out of some physical matter, this more airy or abstract idea, right? So we're always doing that. And that is a, a, a limitation for us. But it also, I think, speaks to exactly the, the problem that we're trying to to get it. because this this Laplacian notion, right, that uh, there, you know, if if a perfect mind could see, know the location and momentum of all particles in the universe at any one time, um, then that perfect mind would have, you know, perfect knowledge of all the motion of the of those particles up until that point and all the notion of that those particles into eternity um forever and ever amen right um i i think this is actually a, a a totally implicit and unspoken premise of the way most people now talk about and think about science casually um it's not the way the most sophisticated philosophers of science talk about science but it is i think what we imagine ourselves to be doing or to be hearing about when we hear that there's been some new discovery in in physics. Um, And this is the billiard ball, you know, the David Humes of the world talking about billiard balls bouncing off each other. And um, the notion that what we're doing when we talk about science and when we, you know, test hypotheses uh, against one another and against experiment um, is we're arriving at a third person objective view or what I call the God's eye view of how things are. Um, And it's understood that how things are means without any observing consciousness, right? With stripping away all of the um, cognitive functions that I just alluded to when I was talking about the the verbum intellectus and and so forth. Um, And if you kind of follow that logic to its next implicit conclusion, um, then really what we're saying is if we look away and these billiard balls or atoms or whatever bounce off each other behind our backs, they will behave, right? We will not uh, find them doing anything nasty or strange or illogical when we walk back into the room. Um, <laughs> Famously, of course, this assumption has collapsed over the last hundred years, right? I mean, this is the whole thing that quantum physics, besides what it has enabled us to do, besides, you know, the the challenges it has posed to uh, sort of classical mechanics, um, at a philosophical level, this is exactly the assumption that has now shown to be false. Whatever else is true, we know it's not that, right? Um, And and I, I acknowledge that, you know, it's a matter of enormous debate what what is going on sort of behind our backs um but as you know niels bohr i think was kind of the best at at articulating this um in some ways the the mystic or the pythagorean guru behind what's now called the the copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics right? um bohr basically said okay so these these equations describe a situation um in which unobserved particles um, are are superposed, and sometimes this is, is sort of popularly expressed as they're in two positions at once, or they're in many positions at once, in many states at once. They, you know, uh, they certain particles have have uh, upspin and downspin. You know, they they uh, exert magnetic charge in two different ways, and so forth. Um, <laughs> all of those are only halfway. They're sort of approximations of what's really going on, which is that 
particles that are not under our observation have a property related to motion and to location, um, which is not describable in any of our terms for motion and location, right? Because our, our experience is that things are in one place and not in another place. Um, what Bohr, I think, understood and what few have is how could it not be other? How could it be otherwise than that things which are not under our observation um, are in states that can't be described in terms that are related to our to our observation. And so this is, you know, to me, um, what we have lost without knowing it is any reason for believing that our kind of material experience of the world um, is reflective of of bedrock reality more than our subject, you know, that our, that our subjective experience of the world, if stripped away, is going to give us some truer, harder, more material idea about about the way things are. Um, what we're learning is that for us, at least, there is no such, you know, there's no getting at such reality. Um, my suspicion, and, you know, it's above my pay grade to say with any certainty, but uh, my suspicion is that that's because the whole concept is kind of a farce um, and that this whatever this relationship is that we're in with objective reality. Right? It's not that objective reality is anything you want it to be. It's not that it doesn't exist. It's not that, you know, any of these things that we're kind of worried about saying um, it's that whatever it is. Right. We have no qualitative access to it except the qualitative access that we have as mediated by our our consciousness. Um, and what that suggests to me is that really bedrock reality is not the small gods that bounce around and behave how we want them to when we turn our backs. It's not these little lumps of indiscriminate matter. Um, bedrock reality is actually much closer to what Aristotle thought it was, which was some kind of union of form with matter, some kind of hylomorphic entity that has both morphe, shape, and hule, stuff. Um, and if that's true, then you really are dealing with a universe that is about uh, you know, a consciousness in relationship to an object of consciousness with some third thing in between them, almost like, you know, I don't know, a, a trinity or something. I'm just talking off the top of my head here, but like, what if, for instance, reality was triune, right? Um, and so, so to me, uh, the reason that this whole thing breaks down um, is because those, what I call the small gods, which is the billiard ball atoms that behave eternally exactly as we observe them to behave when they're under our uh, when they're under our attention, um, they just aren't there, right? They, they don't actually uh, behave that way. And it, 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 it seems much more likely uh, that reality at, at bedrock is formed and relational and, and, um, and ordered in that kind of conscious way. Mm, excellent. Thank you, Spencer. And um, that's one thing I loved about your dad's book, that mm. emphasis on the Trinitarian structure of reality and the kind of how that fractals. I think that sort of fits in nicely with what Jonathan describes in his work. Mm. And um, although there is an element uh, that I wanted to ask you about it, alongside that. So one of the things, um, again, in the conversation between Jonathan and Bernardo, uh, Bernardo mentioned that from what he saw as a kind of empirical philosopher, um, didn't suggest again he had this conception of the kind of meta cognitive god like a too anthropomorphized for my liking but let's use that just for um our purposes here and say the he said the evidence didn't suggest a kind of intelligent god uh, so again he goes back to this kind of Nietzschean uh, Schopenhauer will to power and it kind of interesting he he calls it nature he, he he means nature in a kind of almost virtual way but um ironically enough but then mm. so from my reading of someone like dr stephen meyer he, he notes that the scientific picture that he would see would suggest also the fall and the role of say the demonic and satan it's not that one would expect a kind of pristine creation, even though you'd be seeing it through a kind of long time scales using kind of intelligent design, a kind of evolution, as it were. Does that make sense or the way I'm phrasing it? So say this pull towards entropy is in line, at least with what I'm familiar with, say with orthodox theology and how death, causes us to sin where the emphasis in the east is often on 
death leading to sin rather than a, what's sort of developed in the West. And Dr. Richard Beck talks about that. Does that make sense? <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, you know, it does. I mean, I think that, and, and this is maybe a simplistic way of putting it, but that's, the, I guess, something I've just advocated for. So here we go. I mean, uh, the evidence doesn't suggest an anthropomorphic God as long as you define evidence to only include those things that don't suggest an anthropomorphic God. Uh, <laughs> because in fact, if you want to, you know, and Lewis talks about this in Miracles, right? That if, if, if you're genuinely asking the question, and if you haven't predetermined what you're going to accept as evidence, then the evidence is certainly all around us, right? I mean, we've been talking to some extent about this, what I believe to be some of the evidence, or at least some of the indicators, um, you know, fa Father, I can't remember if it's Father Zosimo or Father Pacey in, uh, in Brothers K, who says this to Ivan, but I think it's Zosimo, he says, you know, it's not possible to be, um, to have these things proven to you, but it is possible to be convinced. That's a really important distinction, right? I mean, the, <laughs> it's certainly true, as Nietzsche argues, right, in the um, genealogy of, of morals, um, it, it, it's certainly true that we find no um, moral code in nature, uh, and indeed that when we operate according to our moral intuitions, we often contradict nature in the brute sense of the food chain, right? Um, and yet, we are part of nature, and we certainly seem to have this pesky thing called the moral code. And it does, seems to stick around uh, even and especially when uh, sort of Nietzschean strongmen attempt to kill it in themselves and others, right? I mean, this is sort of the um, René Girard's very biting assessment of Nietzsche is that, you know, uh, the worst thing in, in the world for philosophers is that really desperate people are all around them and take them at their word, which is the worst thing you could possibly do to somebody like <laughs> Nietzsche. And, 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 and this is, you know, I think it's, it's unfair in a certain sense, and a Nietzschean would certainly consider it very unfair, but there's a kernel of, of truth to it. I mean, at one point Nietzsche talks about um, the church coming along to the Homeric Greek society, the society that was still vital and pulsing with the kind of just will to dominate, which we find in the Iliad and the, you know, the, the Homeric poems, um, and heaping muck onto those, uh, the people in that world, um, and then shining just one pinhole of light through so that they would be grateful for just that pinhole of light. And that's his idea about, you know, sin and ressentiment and all of that. Um, and of course, he also thinks that for the vast majority of, of people, you know, the vast majority of people are, are sheep or worms or what have you. And so they were grateful for some way to attain the greatness that previously was only accessible to the, you know, the sons of the gods, to the heroes. Um, and I think all of that is, you know, an accurate picture of the psychology of the church, except it wasn't the church that came along and he heaped the dirt on people. Do you know what I mean? Like that, that never happened. <laughs> in, in fact, you know, if you read, for instance, the tragedies with which Nietzsche was, was fascinated, um, you will find that it, there was always creeping at the edge of uh, the Greek psyche, this um, nagging sense that ultimately, you know, the tensions in the universe were not going to resolve themselves. I mean, this is, in some ways, uh, what's reflected in the long, the centuries long struggle in the Greek mind between polytheism and monotheism. And I think our popular assumption is, well, there's just, you know, they're just a polytheistic society. We all know the Olympian gods and so forth. But in fact, very early on, from the very birth of philosophy in, in Miletus, right out in, in the East, um, you've got Thales, of course, is the famous kind of originator of philosophy, but he's accompanied by, um, you know, a, a number of others, Anaximander and Anaximenes, who are all arguing over this question, you know, what is the bedrock of reality? Exactly the question that you and I were just talking about, right? What is the thing beyond which nothing is more real, right? And of which all other things are emanations. Um, round about the same time, you also have Xenophanes raising this question like, well, why the anthropomorphic gods don't make any sense, right? This is a, a clearly some kind of um, a, a metaphor or mistake. It's, um, 
And from then on, you know, right on through the kind of Socratic revolution and the, um, you know, uh, Plato and Aristotle's art, various arguments about, you know, the unmoved mover and the form of the good and so forth. Um, and the Euthyphro, especially, you have this sense that, you know, actually, if there is such a thing as, you know, more than one uh, absolute power or, or more than one um, you know, divine force, which we do see in nature, right, which which operates throughout nature, um, then we're royally screwed, because like, the, there's really no way of adjudicating between two absolute powers, right. Um, and this leads many of the philosophers to intuit that if, if you want morality to cohere, there actually has to be one final absolute power. You get this in a lot of different, I mean, Zeus as kind of the god above gods. Um, in, in Zoroastrianism to the east, it's Ahura Mazda, who is kind of giving birth to the other gods or creating the other gods. Um, Plato's Timaeus has the demiurge who creates all the other gods and then go, you know. And so thinking people, not just in the Christian tradition, have recognized, I think, that there are these um, terrible, you know, tensions that grind human beings uh, in between them, like two, like a, an ant caught between two rocks, um, and and that the natural world of itself can basically only furnish that much, and yet, right, we also experience there's there's so much more to our lives than that and to our experience than that um and and, and we have this conviction which nobody put upon the church didn't come and try and convince us of this to gain control for the sheep and some each you know like the nobody nobody uh had to hoodwink us into this we do intuit everywhere lewis calls it the Tao, right that actually some things are right and wrong absolutely um and that's what creates both the sense that you were talking about, that the world, how could we imagine that the world is broken or something's wrong without some picture in our heads of something we've never seen, but that we all know to be there, which is like greater perfection, the perfection toward which everything is driving. So it creates that and it creates the conviction that that's actually like a real thing and, and, and not a fantasy. Um, it's not just that we look at a world of, you know, chaos without any sort of meaning because that would just that would be the end of that and we'd have nothing more to say about it it's not that we perceive a world that's perfectly clockwork the way that you know we could imagine it to be under the auspices of a good and glorious god is that we perceive a world that is approximating a certain form and a certain perfection um, and always yearning toward it but also always falling short um, and for my money original sin in the fall, however, you, whatever direction you want to put the relationship between death and sin, right? The only worldview that accounts for that situation fully is actually the, the Christian one. It's not the Nietzschean one or the, the, you know, triumph of pure nature or Thrasymachus or whoever else. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Spencer. Mm -hmm. That's most clarifying. And um, another area that I think your work has been most helpful for me uh, is so if I might focus on the Renaissance, you, I loved your series on Renaissance art. I think mm -hmm. that was wonderful, but it kind of, it spoke to me in a broader sense. And this is an area I think I actually disagree with Jonathan. I don't know if you've had this conversation, but he's quite anti Renaissance. He seems that as a kind of fall from the early church, whereas I don't see history that way. It seems to me that there's a really interest about consecrating the world where David Fagerberg from um, Notre Dame in America or Notre Dame or whatever you want to <laughs> <laughs> I never know how to say it, but yeah. Sure. So he uh, talks about how in the first century there was this more, um, it, they were more focused on ascetism and things like that. And then after you clear away the dead, what is it were, ascetically, then you can uh, have the world transfigured. And you see this in figures like G.K. Chesterton, who he quotes in the book. And um, I think also in, and he references Charles Williams too, and this notion of romantic theology, which I, I think I've seen you speak about. I wonder what you think about that and how we might read history in a Christian perspective that doesn't, um, again, I think too simplistically look to the early churches. Oh, that's the pristine example. And then it sort of fell apart. And then we got the Renaissance, which is really a pagan movement as if uh, this wasn't, it seems to me, this is an organic growth in the church. And actually 
we're seeing the world more sacramentally through the beautiful art that came with the Renaissance. And again, I think that's where I disagree with Jonathan, this emphasis on nudity and things like that. He doesn't like that because he thinks in a fallen world, we can't have that. But it seems to me that we're getting intimations of the kingdom breaking in now in this kind of mm. beautiful, beautiful physical form. Does that make sense? And I wonder what you think about that. Yeah, no, it certainly does. Um, I got, as I was preparing for that series on Renaissance art, um, I became really riveted by what Giorgio Vasari, who's our real first uh, art historian, what Vasari says about the role of the church in, uh, you, you would almost say bringing about the Dark Ages, right? Um, and I genuinely find it, I, you could read it and say, ha, see, there were all these nasty anti-Christians behind this whole idea of the Renaissance. Or, or you could, you know, if you were this way inclined, you could say, you know, see, the church really, what is the culprit of, you know, if you're a Nietzschean, you could say the church is indeed, thou hast conquered, thou pale Galilean. Um, and I, I think it's what Vasari is saying is much more subtle and complex than that. He, he, he does lay some amount of the blame on the church for the loss especially of technical skill that had been accrued over the you know many many centuries of kind of greek art right then the the pinnacle of uh technique that was achieved under say praxiteles and you know the great painters that decorated the propylia of the um of the acropolis right and and of course recovering those techniques was a major dimension of you know renaissance art especially in italy they were they were digging this stuff up out of the ground you know as they built the fortifications for their cities in like arezzo they would just find like oh look here's the this bronze chimera you know and nobody's ever seen a, a sculpture this way uh, that was this detailed or this alive and um there were all sorts of kind of realizations like that going on around this time in the dugento you know the 1200s or so um 1300s as well and and so people did start to say, well, where where did it all go? How did we lose it? And the kind of typical answer was, well, the barbarians, the barbarians swept through and the Visigoths and, you know, all of the classical world was was burned and, had you know, it had become decadent. But then it was but Vasari says, you know, we have to also give the church some of the blame here um, because in its nascent stages as a kind of infant body that was fighting sometimes for its life, sometimes for supremacy, sometimes for political power, right? Um, it was keen to gain the foothold for the truth. And in order to do that, it had to wipe away all of these old gods, all of the confusion that had obtained, you know, that Plato observes in the Euthyphro of the, you know, the paganism and the ritual and the superstition. Um, and so anything that had bore any trace of that conviction had to be erased and with it was lost the baby was thrown out with the bathwater, and with it was lost all of this technical skill and, and greatness and now at last because we're secure in the truth the things that were kind of uh pale emanations conf being confused for the truth can now be recovered in their rightful sense which is that they can be recovered as they are, right? Um, as as kind of um, subsidiary deities or powers under the one true God. Um, and Lewis, I think, is very affected, perhaps not by Vasari in this, but by this idea, um, which is supportable from scriptural sources. I mean, scripture, we, we don't really acknowledge this so much in America. Maybe it's better for you guys across the pond, but in America, we we are very uncomfortable with the fact that the Bible talks about other gods, right? That the that the Old Testament has Elohim basically bursting out of every page, right? When when the when Psalm eight, I guess it is, says, you know, you have made him a little lower than the angels, that translation even reflects our discomfort with what the actual Hebrew says, which is me'at me Elohim, like a little bit less than the gods, right? Um, so who are all of these gods, right? And 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 Lewis in the Space Trilogy especially kind of works out this um, allegory in which what they really were were kind of subsidiary powers we know there's things in the world if we believe in such things we know that there are supernatural entities that are higher up than us on the divine 
hierarchy, but lower down than gods and than God, rather, uh, the one God. And we call them angels, we call them demons, we call them whatever, but we know that they're things that we submit ourselves to, um, that if we take them to be God, will enslave us. But if we acknowledge them as kind of creations of gods, uh, of God, then they can be very beautiful and joyous, right? I mean, so, you know, Venus, the goddess of love would be an example of this. Um, and, and in, uh, you know, you have in, in the prophecy of Isaiah, um, this wonderful um, and, and sort of difficult to unpack um, passage in which God is said, and I think this is in Job as well, to, to have hooked uh, the great sea monster by the nose, right? Because for, uh, for the Babylonians, this sea monster, this chaos, this primordial darkness was always in a kind of dualistic battle with God. And so for God to have hooked it by the nose just meant this is my, I created this. I, I made uh, all, all of these things. I, I, I made uh, behemoth and I, and I made the, uh, you know, the, the monsters under the sea and so forth. Um, and so this is in some ways, I think, what Vasari is kind of getting at in the Renaissance with the the recovery of all these myths and these uh, stories and allegories from Greek myth, which of course become very important in, in Renaissance art. Um, and I think in some ways, you know, all of the kind of competition between eras and periods um, where it's like, oh, it was the dark ages, right? And of course the Renaissance writers are very guilty of this. Petrarch is uh, culprit number one here, you know, um, the, the, this is this age of ignorance when all these wonderful gifts of culture were being lost. It's like, it, 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 it's a problem that comes from the fact that we live in time, right? Which is also in some sense a consequence of the fall, um, that we, we can't have every good thing at once, right? And sometimes you have to just scrap, just clear all the polytheism off the table, everything that smacks of polytheism, right? Because that's the dominant force in the intellectual world. Um, and just say, nope, like one God, one God only, you, you shall worship him alone. Before you start to uncover, okay, so now that that's established, what was the meaning of all of these other kind of subsidiary things? And so, yeah, I absolutely think, I mean, you described it as light kind of cracking through uh, or, or being refracted through different ways of looking at things. It's in, in, each, in each age, there is kind of a new um, truth. There are new sets of truths that need emphasizing, that need uncovering, sometimes that need dusting off and kind of rehabilitating in light of the Christian revelation. Um, and it stands to reason that new forms of art would come along with that, you know, when you are dealing with the kind of um, medieval church, you deal with what Vasari disparagingly calls the maniera greca, which is the, you know, the gold and the, the big sort of severe figures standing up. But it's like, well, of course, that's what people are moved to see because they're imagining a heaven that is, you know, unutterably beyond anything on earth, right? Um, and the great turn of Renaissance painting is to bring that down to earth. That's the the whole gesture of the Rucellai Madonna, which is one of the pivotal paintings at this time in Tuscany, right? Um, the angels carry the throne of the Madonna almost out of the painting, right? The, the, and, and that is kind of perfectly encapsulates what the what the West is learning at this point, which is that actually the things of this earth, right, the fleshy realities, the stories we tell, all of these, you know, uh, all this profusion of um, enthusiasm and, uh, you know, Greekness, right? The stuff that was kind of cleared away, right? Um, it's not condemned forever. It just, it, it, it needed to be put in subjection for Christ shall put all things in subjection under, under his feet. So I guess I'm like coming out a little bit as a squish on either side of this question. I, I don't think the Renaissance was, um, was a, a falling away, but I also don't think the Dark Ages was really dark. I think that it was, you know, that these things have a natural progression to them, um, which makes actual perfect sense if you understand us as human beings that are on a journey toward, right, the God who has, you know, called us out of darkness into his wondrous light. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor. Mm -hmm. And um, so to, to actually just today, I was listening again to your conversation with your father, and um, I, as I say, I love that book and I loved the emphasis, as I say, on the Trinity and the fractal patterns. So another element of that part of the book was the importance of thinking kind of poetically and metaphorically and understanding reality in that way. I think in line with some of the stuff you've been describing before. 
So um, I wonder if you have come across this kind of notion that Brett Weinstein has that religion is metaphorically true, but literally false. And uh, what are some of the problems with that notion? I suppose, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, This is a at this point, almost a well-worn trope. I mean, it was 2008, I think, that Marcello Pera published Why We Should Call Ourselves Christians, and it's the same idea. Um, it's somewhat, it takes somewhat different forms. You get Don Cupid as well, who was, I think, an Anglican minister, lost his faith, but kept kind of calling himself a Christian. Um, because uh, Nietzsche is right about this much. And Ivan in Brother's Case has almost exactly the same thing. Um, If you want your nice, comfortable bourgeois morality, if you like what Nietzsche called slave morality, and you think we should have societies where we don't simply summarily execute people for their weakness, right? Um, If you want all of those things, you do need God. It's not not a proof of God, because maybe all those things are are nonsense. Um, but if they're not nonsense, and if you don't want them to be nonsense, then you should want to believe in God, right? Um, and, and, and so <laughs> Para and uh, Cupid and, you know, at, at certain stages in their, I don't know where they are on this now, but at certain stages in, the, in their career, you know, Douglas Murray and Tom Holland have made similar arguments, um, have all basically said something to the effect of, we ought to keep this Christianity stuff around because it's where we get the morality that we cherish, the human rights that we cherish, um, and we're not going to, we're not guaranteed to get it from another source, right? And this is the foolishness of wokeness, right? It's tossing it, tossing all that stuff out because now we have a greater morality. It's sort of, well, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years and blood and treasure was spent kind of building this morality up, and it was built out of faith in God, right? It was built out of this particular Christian monotheistic ethos. Um, there are elements of it that you could derive from other intellectual sources you know the stoics also believed that all people were equal in the you know under zeus or what have you um but that's not where we get it right we get it from the church and so it's very likely that if we jettison uh our sort of christianity then we're going to end up with something that looks a lot more like the marquis de sade than saint paul Right. Um, and, and it may take a while. Nietzsche, Nietzsche also observes this really uh, with his characteristic incision. He says, you know, the things that you believe now might just be because you never thought about the fact that they come from beliefs that you don't hold. Right. So maybe your fathers were Christians and so they taught you this morality and now you've given up on the Christianity, but you still sort of reflexively have the morality. Um, and and the argument, I think, or the impulse behind what you might call Christian atheism or um, metaphorical Christianity, the impulse is we want the morality. We want to keep the morality around, but we're too smart to think we can do that without some version of this story. The question to me then becomes, um, do these arguments for you know, say, the universal worth of mankind, because he's in the image of God, right? Um, Do these arguments make sense if the whole image of God thing is just a metaphor? And my argument is, well, well, no, actually, this is not a successful effort, right, to retain what you might call, you know, conventional Western morality. Um, Not only because the people who worked that morality out, weren't working it out in the name of a metaphor, right? They weren't working it out like uh, because they really believed this was a very beautiful story and isn't it nice, but rather because they believed it was, you know, factually true. Um, But also because what is the, you know, just because a story happens to be very beautiful and nice and to inspire very beautiful moral principles um, is, is absolutely no indication that that story itself is true. And if the story is not true, um, then we're really just left. I mean, why don't we just, you know, have those principles to begin with, right? We, 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 we love those principles and we think they're great, but they, we don't come up with them because we, they make us feel nice. We come up with them because we think they're true. Um, and, and so again, like you, I, I'm always thrown back on I, I don't think this is going to work as a project. It doesn't seem to be working very well. And I think the reason it doesn't work very well is because there's it's not firm enough ground on which to establish 
um, on which to establish your morality. The last thing, though, that I will say about this is there's a version of this argument that I could get behind, and that is um, that some metaphors are more true than what we take to be true. And this is, uh, you can see based on what we were talking about earlier, why I would start to want to talk in this way, right? Like, um, because when, and Barfield's, the whole point of saving the appearances, the title is is this, right? That uh, Barfield points out that what the church objected to in, um, in Galileo was not the idea of a, heliocentric universe, which had been proposed since antiquity and was always kind of on the table. Um, it was the notion that there was a physical universe in that kind of behaves the same way behind our back sort of way. Um, and that that's the bedrock of what's true. And once you've said whether the earth revolves around the sun or the sun revolves around the earth, then you've said the final truth about this rather than just a model for describing how your perceptions relate to some ineffable outside world. And so there is a way in which stories, right, convey to us truths that I believe are more bedrock truths than just like the chair is in front of me or the, you know, the uh, specific heat of, uh, of mercury is this, right? Um, but I think that those, those bedrock truths are nevertheless conveyed to us in the form, mostly in, in scripture, in the form of stories that actually happened. Um, because if they hadn't, then people would probably not have been willing to die for them. And if people hadn't been willing to die for them, then you wouldn't have all the nice morality that you want to get by treating the thing as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Spencer. And um, if it might shift direction just briefly, I wanted to ask you in part what, what um, drew you to the classics in the first place? Why did you fall in love with them? What was it about them? And uh, why are they so important in attending to once more from, I suppose, a distinctly Christian perspective? And um, if we might contrast it with the, the smartphone, as I think you've done, why pick up a little a book of a symposium as opposed to the smartphone why is that important in cultivating this attention and these virtues then mm, yeah um I, I will say at the outset that i've never been able to satisfactorily answer this question i mean maybe <laughs> nobody can really say why they love what they love but um a bit, i mean my upbringing has a big you know a big part in it but you know my dad's work it sounds like and he's obviously a, a huge influence on me and uh, not only my father, but a dear friend. And that's, I think, something that not every son gets to share with his, with his dad. And, and so, look, I grew up in a house filled with books. I was, uh, anything that I wanted to read uh, that was age appropriate was like in my hands, you know, so I was enormously fortunate in that way. Um, but I was also the kind of kid that just saw the books on the shelf and, and wanted to read them. And I think, you know, um, Aristotle says that mankind by nature reaches out to know. Um, and this is, you know, one of his central observations about us that we're political and that we desire knowledge. Um, and I'm not so sure. I mean, sometimes I wonder whether Aristotle is talking about himself as much as he's talking about mankind. I mean, I think mankind reaches out to know some things, but not every human being, and this is perfectly fine and good. Not every human being voraciously reads things, but I do. I reach out by nature to know. Um, I remember sitting in my room as a little kid. And I've always looked back on this as sort of like the whatever it is in me that made me want to do scholarship was was present in this, I would have like series of books or, uh, you know, collections of toys. And I would just arrange them according to like different patterns, right. So I was it brought me this enormous satisfaction to have a kind of what the Greeks would have called episteme, which is the theoretical level knowledge that that kind of gathers things together and, and puts them inside a framework. Um, and so that's just a part of, you know, uh, God creates the world anew in each human being. And therefore, like, you know, each human being is going to have a different way of seeing the world. That's mine, right? Um, if that's your inclination and you're a bookish kid growing up in, uh, you know, going through school, I, I think you could you could certainly not do any better than to study Latin and Greek, because not only do you get the high poetry of Virgil and Homer, but you get this mathematical puzzle that has incredibly uh, elaborate sort of 
theory and 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 uh, structural elements for you to sink your teeth into. And that just riveted me. So I was off to the races. Seventh grade, I took a mandatory Latin class. And from there, I was off to the races. So there's something in me that responds to this. I've, I've argued at length, I mean, I probably will argue for my whole life that the, these books are great because they have stuff for you, right? That there's in them is not simply intimidating philosophy, but, you know, actionable knowledge on how to be good at being human. Um, but I think that there's another level of it, where, which is just simply the, you know, the joy and the, the pleasure of, of reaching out to know. And, you know, I, I wasn't raised a Christian, as, as you know, my dad converted sort of while I was growing up. Um, but as it became clear that I believed in God, um, it never even occurred to me that that would sort of shut me off from this kind of Rich, the richness that I found in in the great works, I, it almost seemed impossible, right? For if anything is truly good, lovely, and of good report, right, then it's going to come from God, and so understanding or desiring to know God is going to enrich and deepen and fulfill that in some way, and that has been my experience, and that has been why I'm always on the kind of um, you know I, I'm on the anti-Tertullian side, the Irenaean side of this question about pagan wisdom, right? I think it becomes fulfilled in light of Christ's revelation, not jettisoned or made useless. Um, and and that's, that kind of conviction has only ever been confirmed by attempting to bring a Christian interpretation to any number of, you know, extra Christian sources. Mm, brilliant. Thank you so much, Spencer. And um, since discovering classical education, I have been been drawn to the emphasis on leisure and um, its ultimate importance or play, I suppose, in part because it's such a stark, con it seems to me it's such a stark contrast with the materialistic kind of visions, either say in the communist mode or the capitalist mode, where everything has to have this kind of value that pertains to the state or it has to be economically viable in that crude, crude kind of materialistic way. Hmm. I suppose, um, has that, have you? A, have you been moved by people like Joseph Paper and that notion of leisure, leisure and its importance? And um, so how does that work for individuals, number one? And then how does that scale in a society like uh, classical schools, which have a much greater space for this understanding of play and its importance? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, it's easy to get elitist when you start talking about this because there is this is an area in which the church has revised or altered what Aristotle had to say. I think there's no there's no getting around that there are some of those areas, and this is probably one. Um, you know, Aristotle argues that you can only attain eudaimonia, the good life, the you know the the fruition of full virtue, if you have a certain amount of property. Uh, because you have to be able to execute on whatever noble aspiration comes to your mind, but also because you need time and you need uh, resources to be sitting around and thinking about what is the good life and how do I put it into into action. And, you know, I, I would suggest that the church rightly understood or Christianity rightly understood should resist this strenuously, at least in its absolute form, because we know uh, it, it's been brought home to us with particular weight lately that sometimes the people with the least leisure, the least power, the least money are by far more virtuous and more virtu more sensible, more ethically sensible uh, than people with vast sums in the bank and, uh, you know, nothing but time to devote to thinking and playing around. So I think we, we always have to keep our eye on that and ask, so how can we, as it were, save the appearances, right? How can we rescue this Aristotelian idea about leisure? Um, in light of what the church has revealed and what just our own eyes can show us about um, the, the corrupting influences of, of wealth. Um, and I think we can do it very easily if we, if we understand leisure to be what Aristotle does say it is, which is that which we do for its own sake, right? And, and the reason he wants his students to have money and to be comfortable at a certain level um, is not because he thinks that's necessarily good in and, and of itself, um, but because he thinks that it's only when those sorts of concerns are off the table that 
the human person can fully reveal itself, right? As you know, because then you're doing what you're doing for the sake of doing, it. not so that you can survive, not so that you can like, you know, uh, be protected from enemies or have food. Um, but the conviction, I think, of any liberal arts education is that if you didn't have to worry about all of those things, you wouldn't just simply sit there in contentment. There would be actually a surplus of positive energy in you that responds not to some need or lack, um, but rather to what we might think of as a joy, right, that responds out of... And so that idea, um, which is accessible, I think, to anybody, um, is crucial if we're to think about, you know, what is the vision of the human person that the classical education can deliver that the world is singularly ill-equipped to either offer or understand. And we have a political crisis going on right now that illuminates this very question perfectly. And that is the environmental apocalypticism uh, that is causing people to hurl cans of paint onto you know, Van Gogh's and so forth as, as we speak. Um, and besides the fact that apocalypticists are by far, uh, far and away, not the best educated among us about energy sustainability, right? Besides the fact that somebody like Michael Schellenberger, you know, it, it runs circles around them when it comes to what's actually going to be good for the planet. Mm -hmm. Leaving all of that aside, um, you listen to the way these people talk and act when it comes to people, right? That people are parasites on the earth, that people are a net negative or drain for other species and for the planet, right? Um, and really, at a philosophical level, the crisis that we're up against with the environmentalist extremists, just like with, you know, the antinatalists and anybody that says that, you know, we need fewer people on this earth for whatever reason, um, is what's the point of existence, right? Is it for something outside, external to human happiness to be maximized, whether it be economic efficiency or uh, ecological diversity or whatever, like, God you want to set up in that place, right? Um, or is it good that humans should be, per se, as an end unto themselves? Um, because God desires that it should be so, right? The kind of Christian attitude, which is expressed in Genesis by that repeated, it is good, right? Is that the things which are, are because God delights in them. God didn't have to make them. He would have been perfect without them. They themselves, right, are, uh, can offer him nothing. And yet he, out of his great love, is, is absolutely overjoyed and over the moon that they should be, right? And we don't talk about this enough as Christians. It's like, you, the, why are you supposed to love your neighbors yourself? It's because just like you, this is a person that God was so profoundly delighted to bring into existence that he did so at the cost of his own death, right? And, and that is just a radically, that, that's the kind of thing that I really call a crisis in the Greek sense of the word crisis, two irreconcilable ways of looking at the world, right? You can't view human beings as, as parasites on the one hand and make a compromise between that and the Christian idea that people are there because God wants them to be there. And in fact, they are the, the, pinnacle and capstone of a creation which is there because he wants it to be there. Um, and of course, you know, I know which one of those ideas is more moving and beautiful to me, um, but I also think it's it's more true and logically consistent because we don't observe really that the world appreciates its own beauty very much without us to do so, right? So we're obviously playing this crucial role and we are the point, right? The point is us. Um, and the point is not us in some selfish way, but rather we are, it's our responsibility to be the kind of final capstone of this entire, the entirety of creation. What does this have to do with classical education? Well, that to me is the idea of play. That's what play is and leisure, right? Play and leisure are our, um, you know, and we can do them in a, in a very serious level. It's not just messing around. They are our expression of the fact that if we didn't have to worry about all this other stuff, if we didn't have to pay the bills, if we didn't have to uh, wake up in the morning and brush our teeth, whatever, there would still be stuff that we wanted to do because it was good, right? And knowing is one of those things. That's why mankind reaches out to know, right? Um, so yes, I think like this kind of thing, which is very much alive in a lot of, I mean, Jordan Peterson's talking about it a lot now. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of people that are speaking very profoundly on this subject. And why are we hitting up on it? Because it expresses the idea um, that actually some human goods, the highest human goods, um, are there simply because 
they are good, not because they serve any other purpose. Mm, that's beautiful. Thank you, Spencer. Mm. And um, just to close, really, for this evening, because I'm cognizant, I don't want to take too much of your time, although I could ask you a million questions. I'm well, sure. I've kept you up so late already. It's, <laughs> it must be getting good bedtime over there. So uh, I wanted to ask you about your forthcoming book, which I must look forward to. What has moved you to write that, I suppose, if it's not already obvious? And what do you hope readers will take away from it then? Oh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. I, not only do I like talking about it, but my publishers will be very happy because <laughs> they want me to be talking about it from now until the release date, which I think is February 14th. So coming out, you can pre-order it. Um, it's called How to Save the West, which is a very daunting, to me, a very daunting title. Um, and I think people probably will look at that and think, who the hell is this guy? Um, but as I explained very early on in the book, it's actually a more modest proposition than you might think. Um, and part of the point of uh, writing the book was to convince people that um, this thing which we all desire, which is a kind of, or, you know, all thinking people have some yearning, I think, for to, to restore whatever it was that, you know, made us happy, prosperous, and, and free, and feel a great sense of anxiety that those things are slipping away. And that includes the you know, people on the left and the right. This is not a political point, really. Every, everybody has a sense, I think, that we're, you know, hurtling toward crisis after crisis. Um, and, and so, you know, my suggestion in the book is that these crises which come at us in the form of kind of constantly uh, renewing news cycles that flare up and then die right and 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 they're they can be big like the war in ukraine or they can be small like you know this uh down the street uh somebody was murdered last night and you know it seems to be part of a, a rising rising crime race, all of which strike us as completely beyond our control and yet paradoxically under the skin of those crises beneath the day-to-day -day of the news cycle our actual profound and quite ancient questions about the human person uh, and our relationship to creation and to God, um, which are being dredged up again, as they often do in times of turmoil in, in many ways because of the digital age, right? They're being dredged up again and demanding answers and answers are on offer, right? They are uh, in, in, in great supply in the great works of the West. They're there for people to grasp and incorporate into their lives. And most importantly, they're actionable. So you can't fix by yourself, right, the kind of strange transhumanist uh, phenomenon that's driving people into all these insane contortions with their bodies from, you know, transgender surgeries up to, uh, you know, sort of digital enhancements or even virtual reality, right? You can't muscle that out of existence. But what you can do is ask, what exactly is the question on the table here? The question on the table is, how am I supposed to relate to my own body? And there are great answers to this. So basically what I present in the book is five different crises that I think are motivating so many of our um, seemingly insurmountable challenges. And I just propose using the great works that we've been talking about, um, I propose a few answers for how you can live your life differently tomorrow um, so that you will be part of the solution and not the problem in your own life and for those around you, for your own community, which ultimately, right, is the West, right? Ultimately, the point is that the West is not some, you know, any one nation or some grand uh, project or design, but actually it's a way that people have been living and have passed on to their children that you can also adopt and incorporate. Um, it's there for you, the book's designed to kind of to help you help you grasp it um and yeah i really hope uh, i hope people will enjoy it because it's been uh, on my heart for a while wonderful thank you spencer i think unfortunately it's coming out in ireland in april <laughs> it's after you're kidding oh i didn't know that okay <laughs> <laughs> but it's probably february in america as you say so i'm gonna have to wait it longer unfortunately but um, i will pull some i'll get you a copy early i'll pull <laughs> Thanks, some spencer. and um where are then can viewers or listeners find out more about you and your work just finally Thank you for asking. Um, there is, you mentioned uh, Young Heretics, my podcast. Um, I'm also on Twitter. That's the easiest way, I think, to hear from me on the daily uh, at, at Spencer Clavin. Um, and I, we have a locals page, youngheretics.com forward slash locals that you can check out in addition to the book. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Spencer, and God bless you. Thank you. God bless. Likewise, it's been such a pleasure. Nobody gets no